Hello and welcome to the final preseason edition of the Doster T.O. and Fanta Podcast. Boys, the season is here. We are recording this today. It is Thursday, November 3rd, 10 a.m. We had a lot of very frustrating NCAA rulings over the course of the last couple of days. But I, we're going to get to that in a second. I'm going to yell in a second. I'm going to get mad in a second. But before we do that, Fanta, T.O., the season's here, baby. How fired up are you guys? Are we ready to go? Beyond pumped. I'm juice. Are you kidding me? It's cold outside. The leaves are coming down here in the south. It's like that kind of crappy. You don't see the sun. It's still cold, still kind of waiting. But it's here. Thank goodness. I'm sick of doing hypotheticals all the time. I'm ready to get going. Oh, Actually, man. I, am, I cannot yeah. tell you how done I am this preview <laughs> season. I am so oh, done. Let's kick it off. Let's tip this season off. We're tipping off the season on Monday night when T.O. is going to have a New York City Italian dinner paid for by Jeffrey Goodman. It's going to be a fantastic <laughs> experience, a fantastic week. And, guys, I cannot wait. Cannot wait to walk into the world's most famous arena on Tuesday, Madison Square Garden, because it is true for those who say it's not true or that's overrated. Having an event at Madison Square Garden elevates it automatically. Having Coach K make his last walk into that building on Tuesday night with Paolo Bancaro making his collegiate debut, with a new-look Kentucky team trying to bounce back, with Kansas, a hopeful team to be a Final Four team, and an underrated, when Tom Izzo's at his best, Michigan State team walking in the building. People want to find out what are they exactly. Tuesday night at the Garden is going to be special for the sport of college basketball. It is a perfect way to tip off the season I love the Champions Classic. I think it's the sports one of the sport's biggest assets. This is going to be a fun, fun season. We've said it all preseason. We're in for the best college basketball year in quite some time, and there's not a more fitting way to tip it off than on Tuesday night inside the Mecca. So there is no building in America that is better for a non-conference neutral site basketball game than Madison Square Garden. T.O., you are going to find this out firsthand on Tuesday night. But that's not exactly the tip-off of the season, guys. This is the official announcement. We haven't made this public yet. But on Tuesday, leading up to the Champions Classic, we are going to be live streaming for nine consecutive hours. I'm going to be involved. Jeff Goodman is going to be involved. Both of the gentlemen that you see here with me on this podcast, they are going to end up being involved. We have Archie Miller and Sean Miller. They are going to be involved in the show. We have Randolph Childress, the Wake Forest legend. He's going to be involved. We have Shelvin Mack and Steve Prohm are going to join me for an hour to break down film. We have the guys from the three-man weed that are going to bring you everything that you need to know to prepare yourself to bet on the Champions Classic. We have Sleepers Media are going to be taking us for the last two hours into the Champions Classic. I cannot possibly be more fired off to kick up, uh, fired up, to kick off, let me get that right. Fired up to kick off the Field of 68 After Dark show with a nine-hour live stream, boys. Nine hours. Nine hours. T.O., you know a, this. Goodman that's wanted a lot to of content, for baby. Four hours. Goodman wanted to go for 24 straight hours to kick <laughs> off. We had to talk him down to nine. It took a lot of negotiation to get Goodman off of 24 hours of live streaming. And we had to take we had to we had to get him off of 68 teams as opposed to the top 50. Oh boy. He wanted to do a countdown of every single team in America. We had to st- we're gonna start in April next year, 358 teams. Here is our top 358 <laughs> countdown. We don't know what the roster is gonna be, but let's just talk to the coaches and have some <laughs> they got nothing else to do, right, Goodman? Yeah. But uh yeah, field of 68 after dark. Make sure you check that out every night after the games during the season. Every single night we're gonna be live streaming on YouTube, live streaming on Twitter, and dropping that audio into your podcast feeds. There's going to be no bigger names. Think about it. There, there are no bigger names than the names that I just mentioned that are doing college basketball. There are no more relevant names, no better names. It's going to be the best show, man. I, I don't, I cannot be more fired up. I'm so, I'm so excited about this. So, uh, and I'm mostly I'm excited to work with you guys. I've had a lot of fun getting this podcast rolling over the course of the last month and a half. Fanta, I've known you for a while. T.O., we just kind of knew each other or got to know each other over the last couple of months, but you do your homework. You're ready to go, and I'm, I'm fired. Can you tell I'm fired up? Can you guys tell I'm fired oh, up? 
Let's go. And and there's nothing. It's going to be about four o'clock. I bought this just for this. About four four o'clock that day. It's going to be that. No, it's going to be great. I'm excited. Fanta, I interrupted you. I didn't mean to. Uh, No, I'm just appreciative that I get to be a part, man. Whenever you guys started this platform, um, basketball heads like me who were watching from afar, who kind of want to get into it and just talk sports. I mean, this is just the perfect situation. It's all basketball all the time. If you want football, you go to field of 12. But for basketball, you go to field of 68. And there's such good information that you can get out of this platform and it's conference specific, it's team specific. And that's one of the greatest things about what you guys have been doing. You're not just throwing darts at somebody over there. You're bringing them to you. And that is one of the coolest things because your access, Jeff's access, Big East access with uh, Mr. Fanta is unprecedented. Nobody else has it. And there's a level of comfortability with you three, with those coaches that's so much different than what is uh, supplied in other markets and other you know outlets or what have you. This is truly a unique site uh, for really college basketball heads everywhere. So that was fun. We got that out of the way. Now we got to talk about something a little more frustrating. Uh, right off the bat. I think right off the bat, we need to go to Oklahoma State. And you guys are going to have to forgive me because I'm going to have to get up on my soapbox for a minute because this uh, – all right, let's just – this is a recap. Oklahoma State had their appeal – against a postseason ban upheld on uh, I guess it was on Wednesday well Tuesday night they found out they announced it on uh, Wednesday morning Mike Boynton and that staff started leaking out the news to the to the reporters and the people that they know um, after they told the players after they told the families after they did a lot of stuff so they are going to be banned not only from the NCAA tournament this season but they are going to be banned from the Big 12 tournament this season they the NCAA made this decision and they upheld this ruling on November 2nd six days before the season starts. So before we get into whether or not this is this is something that is fair and is right and is just, they made this decision six days before the, the season started. It, that To me, that is unfathomable, the level of cruelty to the players on this roster. They get four chances to play in the tournament. They get four chances to play in the postseason. You take one of those away six days before the season started. You don't give them a chance to transfer. You don't give them a chance to find a better place to play. You don't let them decide if this is going to be the right fit for them. They, you had players come in to the program this offseason, transfer into the program and use their one-time transfer eligibility uh, to get to, to play for this Oklahoma State team. They're not going to be able to do that. You let them know six days before the season. And, yes, I understand, oh, they should have known. They should have expected this. This was a ruling, blah, 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 this, that, the third, whatever. Make that decision early enough so that these kids have enough time to be informed. It is not fair. College sports should be about the kids and about the players. This was definitively not about the players. But the part of it that pisses me off the most is you, there's no possible way for you to can, you can justify a postseason ban for what this Oklahoma State program went through. Lamont Evans was not cheating. Cheating, by definition, is something that you're doing that will break the rules for a competitive advantage. There was no competitive advantage gained with what Lamont Evans was doing. He was a rogue employee breaking laws, breaking federal laws, uh, accepting bribes, from a financial advisor that had embezzled $2.3 million from prior clients, accepting bribes of him to funnel players that were supposed to trust him, that were supposed to believe in him, that were supposed to think that he had their best interests in mind. He was sending those players to a guy that was known to be a fraud artist and a con artist and someone that stole money from his clients. Lamont Evans is a criminal. What Lamont Evans did deserved jail time. He got jail time. His career blew up in his face. He's never going to work Uh, in college athletics again. He's never going to be a coach again. He's never going to be able to do what he loves again. He paid the fire. He paid the price. He did the crime. He did the time. He paid the price. His career is over. Jeffrey Carroll, the guy that accepted the $300 in payments from him, the guy who committed the NCAA violation, was the victim here. He was the guy that was getting peddled to someone that was going to steal his money. He was the guy that was listening to someone that was supposed to trust him, someone in a position of power that was supposed to be advising him on ways to get into uh, this basketball world, to protect their money, to live their life the way that you need to be able to live it, to be an adult who was sending him to someone that was going to steal his money to produce movies with Misha Barton and Devin Sawa. Like, what the fuck are we even talking about here? How can that be something where five years after the fact, you're punishing a bunch of kids that didn't have their driver's license when this violation was committed? It's completely unacceptable. It's completely bullshit. And, and I just, I don't know how 
how you can justify that if you are the NCAA. I don't know how you can look at that and say we made the right decision. I don't know how you can look at the way that Mike Boynton, that that coaching staff, that, that, that those players reacted to the punishment that you gave and think, yes, we did the right thing. You can go down. I'm going to put my head on my pillow tonight, and I did the right thing. I did my job well. I am happy with who I am at this point in my life. I, I, it, it, it's unfathomable to me. And I think Mike made a really good point. And, and first and foremost, in his press conference, I don't know if you guys saw it, but I've never seen a coach react the way to a ruling that Mike reacted. He was in tears on stage, mm-hmm. right? He read the name of every single person in that. The that was huge. That was huge. Yeah. He read the name of every person that made this decision. And he said, you guys are just looking at a ruling on paper and you can go home and you can go to sleep. You don't have to go into that room of 18, 19, 20 year olds and tell them that their dream of playing in the NCAA tournament is blowing up because of something that happened when they were sophomores in high school. You don't have to go in and tell the parents of the kids that you recruited they're not going to be able to play in the postseason this year because of something that happened before I was here, before the coaching staff was here, before that program was there. Nobody associated with this single NCAA violation that was committed is still involved with that Oklahoma State program. But we're punishing them for a postseason ban that South Carolina didn't get, that Alabama didn't get, right? What, what, what are we doing here? How is this the right decision? How is this the right move? And the last point that I'm going to make before I let you guys go is that from what I was told from, from people within that program is that when they made their appeal to the NCAA, the NCAA did not evaluate whether or not the decision that they made was correct. They did not appeal the decision. They appealed the process. And what the NCAA is saying is we adjudicated this process correctly. We're not going to re- we're, we're not going to reevaluate what the committee on infractions decided, even though that ruling was fucking bullshit. What we're going to do is determine whether or not the process was done in the right manner. Do we follow the steps correctly? And they followed the steps correctly, and they made a shitty decision. And they're not going to reevaluate that, and they're not going to change it. And it's awful. It's terrible. And I don't know. I, I don't think there's a there's anything that Oklahoma State can do about it at this point. But it, it just if, if I rant a lot about the NCAA, some of it is tongue in cheek. Some, some of it is just kind of a bit. Some of it is just kind of staying on brand. But this, this one, this decision legitimately pisses me off. And I just, I feel so bad for Mike Boynton. But I will tell you guys this. I think that this might end up being long-term a great thing for him recruiting-wise because I'm willing to run through a wall for that dude right now. And I'm 37 years old with two kids and I haven't played basketball in like two years. And I... I I don't know how any player, any family can watch that and say, I don't want to go for war, uh, go to war and play for that dude. So, okay, I'm done. I had to get that off my chest. I don't really feel all that much better, but it, it's good to kind of to kind of get that rant out. Fanta, where do you stand on this? Lamont Evans was arrested in September 2017. There should be nothing that has to do with this incident coming down on people that had nothing to do with it in November 2021. It's about to be 2022. And this is another example of, if you're going to review the process at which they arrived at that decision, the process might be even worse than the decision itself. Because the process of these decisions is lacking any uniformity. There's no sense of organization. We don't know what's happening from one school to the next what to expect. And again, when you take this amount of time, you end up impacting dozens upon dozens of people, not just these players, but their families in an era where mental health is getting prioritized and rightly so. Do you think about the impact that this has on these 18 to 22 year old kids who have to show up every day now play, go to class, go to all this, and there's no sense of reward, really. Mike Boyden now has to figure out a way to create some sort of motivational factor, something that his team can rally behind. And the fact is that's that's just not reality in 2021. Uh, It's wrong. Am I surprised by it? Not at all. Not even remotely. Not even remotely. What I don't understand is how in this sport you can have this punishment occur, but you can have some head coaches who have been literally caught on tape, blatantly cheating, and they're allowed to coach their teams next week. 
and you could say, well, everybody cheats or a lot of coaches cheat. It's not just them. Then all the more reason to not hand down a punishment to make yourselves look like that you know what to do in terms of infractions when you're handing it down to a school that has a guy who, who did his time, Rob, you said it, he did his time. You know, there's that balance of like legality where the government gets involved and now this organization gets involved. And the fact of the matter is this, the government got involved. He was arrested. He did his time. He did his time. That should supersede anything that the NCAA is going to hand out now, mm-hmm. nor, nor alone. They're, they're handing out something that impacts kids in a worse way, I think, mentally, and in a worse way for their journey and for how they're trying to stay on track. Now they're going to be considering other stops. Now you're considering all these other variables than one guy who got arrested and did his time and, you know, I, and now it's done with. So I'm not surprised. Um, and, and, you know, we can harp on changes needed. I doubt that it'll ever be made in this, in this realm of things. Um, it's, it's not, it's, it's something that's just wrong. I, that's all I can say. It's, it's yeah. really gut wrenching to see these kids get impacted when they had zero to do with it. Two things. And then I'm going to, I'm going to let you have your say to you. Um, one, we, we keep, we keep referring to cheating here. I want, I want to make very, very clear to everybody that is listening to this. There was no cheating involved. Cheating is the, the, the definition of cheating is going around the rules to get a competitive advantage. There was no competitive advantage here. Nothing that Lamont Evans was doing was about bettering Oklahoma State, the program, the basketball team, the university, none of that. It was about bettering Lamont Evans. It was about aligning his pockets. It was about accepting bribes. This was a rogue employee doing something to better himself. The only thing that happened within that program is he gave a kid $300 and the kid was suspended three games for it. 300 bucks. Two, according to Norlander, right? Uh, Matt Norlander, CBS Sports, who's, who's been all over this story. This ban is the first in NCAA history where a school received a postseason ban without being assessed one of these five major va- violations. Head coach responsibility charge, lack of institutional control, failure to mo- monitor a recruiting violation, or an academic fraud. Yeah. This was a rogue employee who didn't want to cooperate with the NCAA system after he was fired by Oklahoma State, and you're punishing the school for it. And players that had nothing to do with it, players that are not even connected to them. It just apparently uh, it's a rogue. Apparently it's a rogue investigation, To because because in 2021, for as long as the NCAA has existed, I'm sorry, you should not be doing something for the first time in history. Now. No. No, you shouldn't. I mean, here's my thing, too. In the NCAA, we've all known to be extremely self-serving. So this happened last year. Cade Cunningham's no longer there. He's not going to drive the same amount of revenue. So the NCAA brings the hammer down. They're not going to bring down the hammer on some of these bigger name schools. And we all know which schools I'm talking about. I'm not going to single them out. But I just I feel really bad for the kids. First of all, the timing of this decision is absurd. What did Musa Cisse do? transfer from Memphis. He wanted to come over and play in the big 12. What did Avery Anderson do? Nothing. Caleb Boone, nothing. These kids weren't even in college. How could they have changed their behavior? They couldn't. Uh, You know, I almost want to make a joke and say, well, like if it's like that one guy who talks back to the coach, now everybody has to run, but imagine the guy talked back to the coach six, five years ago, and then now everybody has to run. It's like the weirdest thing I've ever seen. And, And not to mention, Boykin, what, Boykin, what is it even the coach? What even his administration? We're five years ago. It's sad. It's embarrassing. The, the ineptitude of the NCAA on this. And you expect more. I mean, they just hired Florida State's AD, who was well-respected up at the NCAA. Now it's like, how do you mess this up so royally? That's the confusing portion of this entire, of this entire decision. And the fact that there's nothing really you can do really processes this whole stream of events as the beginning of the end. And people have been saying, well, they might step away. They might step away. Power five might do this or big six or power, the group of five, what have you. If this continues, people are going to start taking exception 
And people are starting, there, there's too much money involved at this point. There's too much, uh, there's too many other things involved for Oklahoma State to say, well, we're just going to take it and walk off. Yeah. There's going to be a chain of events that results from the entire uh, FBI investigation that I think the NCAA, they better pull their pants up and, and acknowledge their mistakes. And they're not going to. We both know that. We're not going to. But uh, I think that's kind of where we're at. Uh, it's 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 sad it's really sad for the kids in particular and, and you know they didn't do anything it's 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 Mike, too bad Mike said that one guy on his roster literally at when he came up and and uh after everything yesterday and said uh, hey we're we're banned from the postseason because this happened one of the kids on his roster was like wait what are you talking about because it was yeah. so long ago he had no idea he was a freshman in high school when all of this stuff he was 14 years old he was 14 yeah. years old when all of this stuff happened. And now he's not going to be able to have a chance to play in the tournament because of this. And, and you mentioned Stan Wilcox. Without without getting too out of line, I'll just say he was the guy that ran his mouth to a reporter saying that they're going to drop the hammer on Kansas before any of this process was started. So I think it's, uh, it, it's pretty clear that he's trying to make a point here. Yeah, we're the NCAA. We're going to come down on all these guys that are cheaters when they have absolutely. But, but then you don't go after Kansas. That was my point. Yeah, then you I, I just it, they're they're just go after Oklahoma State, the fourth best, the, the fourth best team, and all that stuff. I mean, but I, I meant before he came there. No, you're, like, no, no, you're right. I just wanted to make a point that that that, yeah. that Stan Stan Wilcox might be the guy that's driving the clown car. Is all I'm saying. Um, yeah. All right, let's get to Kofi Coburn because I think that's worth touching on as well. Uh, Illinois announced on I guess it was Tuesday at this point that he was going to be suspended for three games as a result of. Uh, committing a violation that is no longer a violation. He sold team-issued uh, apparel on the web. I believe it was on Players Trunk back in June when everybody thought that he was going to the NBA draft. Um, you were not allowed to do that and return to school because this happened before the NIL legislation was put into place. I know there are different rules in every state. Um, I don't think anybody really understands kind of it nationally. My understanding uh, and I think this was backed up by reporting from Jeff Borzello of ESPN.com. In Illinois, right now, you are allowed to sell team-issued memorabilia after the fact. Uh, I, who, who fucking knows what these, these NIL rules? Yeah. But um, I'll let you guys have your say on this. I, I just want to make one point. I just think it's the height of stupidity and uh, a very a very dumb PR play to suspend a kid for a violation that was committed Three, month, uh, three weeks before a rule changed to make it so that this is no longer a violation. I think it is the typical kind of uh, NCAA brand move to be able to, um, to punish uh, your best players and get the, the stars of the sport off of the court so that they play less. And I think that it is exactly what you would expect out of an organization that did all of the stuff that we talked about for Oklahoma state to create an incentive for a guy that came back to school to, for, for a guy that came back to school to punish him for something, to create an incentive for the next Kobe Coburn to not come back to school. It just, I, I'm, I'm not going to get all self-righteous about it. I just think it's dumb. I understand why they do it. And by the letter of the law, it's, it's kind of what you got to do, but it's just, it's, it's the height of stupidity, man. And it's just such a horrible PR move, but Hey, look, the NCAA PR, they're never going to be able to get out of their own way. Well, I think sometimes if, if the PR folks had something to say about it, it wouldn't even, it wouldn't be a thing. You know, sometimes they're just getting handed what the, what the ruling is and Hey, you got to put this out there. And I, I'm sure there's been a time or two where they've been thinking, Oh boy, like, you know, this is going to, this is going to explode on social media and implode for, for us. Um, I, look, the, the Kofi Coburn, to me, when I first saw the news, I thought, okay, this is the NCAA making an example out of someone so that it gets noticed to the, the country and then it gets noticed by other student athletes that, hey, we are monitoring this. We're looking at it closely. Even though it is a free market, uh, they found a loophole uh, by him doing something right before NIL uh, became a thing. And by the letter of the law, yeah, it is a violation. Uh, other players have – that's why – am I surprised? Not at all. Uh, but I feel like, you know, we groan at this, and, and rightfully so. I don't know if anything's really going to change about it. But for Kofi Coburn, it's unfortunate. It stinks. He chose to come back to college basketball. 
Um, I think Illinois will be just fine. You know, they, they have a game at Marquette. Um, and that's still a game that even without Kofi Coburn, I think Illinois will probably be favored in. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't want to, I don't want to hate on your Big East guys, uh, fans. And I know you're, I know you like Shaka and, and To. I know you like Shaka in this spot too. But I don't know if, uh, I don't know if Illinois needs Kofi to, uh, to beat this this Marquette team right now. <laughs> yeah, probably not. Or no, no, I, I agree, I agree with you. Uh, but, but I think you know, they're going to be fine. Um, they, they, I just, I feel for the kid because. Like we, we just, we, we get so in the weeds on some of this stuff and we forget that we're just talking about guys that haven't even fully, like, they don't even fully know who they are or, or what they are yet because they're at such a young age. We did all kinds of stupid stuff when we were at that age that, that no. these guys, <laughs> that no, these guys really, that all these of my guys, decisions were well thought out plans. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. So I look, I'm with you, Rob. It's, it is, it's disgruntling T.O., but um, I, I hope that it I, I will be by December we will have forgotten about this I think everybody else will I think this is just going to be a blip now here's my thing where this differs from Oklahoma State is that the law was at that time was pretty clearly defined mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that I, I do, there's not as much sympathy for me when it comes to Kofi on this one he broke a rule he's going to serve three games we're not really even going to think about it. He's still going to be a all Big Ten player. He's still going to be a potential All American. He's still going to be in line for all these awards. It's not really going to matter. Uh, is the NCAA posturing a little bit? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it, it is what it is. It was still against the rules. So my sympathy in this particular occasion is not where I, I, I think yours is, Doster. But I, I also think um, that you know, hey, I, I I grew up. If that's the rule, that's the rule. Mm -hmm. there's not a whole lot of leeway if, if that's a rule that's a rule so uh he did it he serves his he serves his suspension and we move on i he's, he's, we don't even have to talk about it uh past those three games no you're right and it's definitely one of those things where we're talking about it because like what the hell else do we have to talk about at this point Good point like, it's it's the end of preview season man we need hoops to get here uh, yeah. but i mean you're right like i i can't I think it. I think it's dumb, and I think it's silly, and I think it's just like a bad PR look to punish something, punish someone for something that is no longer, uh, no longer against the rules um, after the fact. But like, it's also he broke he broke the rule. Like, you can't really complain about it all that much. So um, it is. No, wait, I have a question on this. If I can okay. ask, you so did he? I just want to clarify here. Did he? Was he selling this merchandise? at a point when he was still in the NBA draft or was he coming back to Illinois and this stuff was available for purchase? Cause I don't remember. I'm pretty sure. Time. I'm pretty sure at this point he had had to have withdrawn from the NBA draft. Cause if I'm the, if my timeline is correct. He was doing this. Uh, he had it on there. Yeah. I think he put it on there when he was declared for the draft and it was on there in June. I want to say, I'm not really sure. On the like, so he might've put it on there. He might've put it on there when he declared for the draft. And I'm guessing he never even took it down. That's what I would assume happened. Yeah. That's what I would assume. How much money could he actually make? I mean, who wears a 5X? Well, it's, it's just like, – like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, it's getting that Kofi Coburn jersey where you can have it like T.O.'s uh, jersey in the background. Over the <laughs> How much would you guys – let me ask you this. How much would you pay for a framed and signed, game-worn Terrence Oglesby Clemson uniform? How much would I pay? No, I want to know how much Fanta would pay. Of, of the Terrence Oglesby one? Tell I'd have to pay him to give it to him. <laughs> if it comes with one of those free Mike Tyson grills, probably fourteen ninety nine. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I have the, I have a Mike Tyson picture of Punch Out. Him autographing a picture of Punch Out. So I'll well, throw that one in there hey, too. That's actually worth some. That's it's gonna be yeah, worth. That's some not money. bad. That's not yeah. bad. All right. Dude, that uh, might be an in season. That might be an in season game. How much would you pay? That's it for this uh, for this player's jersey. Yep. That, I mean, that'll be how much would you pay for uh, for for any, that, you know, that'll be a we're, we're gonna have to circle back on this. How much would you pay to blank? That's gonna be a new bit that we have on the podcast. Um, all right, uh, Tio, this was a segment you wanted to do. Let's get into actual basketball stuff we can talk about and stop worrying about NCAA violations. Uh, you wanted to do something on underrated players nationally, and I know you have a couple guys in mind, so I'm gonna give the floor to you and kind of talk through, um, you know, guys that you don't think are getting enough attention in college basketball right now. Well, I, I have two. Uh, so for 
I have one freshman and then one upperclassman. The upperclassman is Parker Stewart. Uh, Pitt transfer down to UT Martin, goes to UT Martin, averages 19 points, four boards, and th- almost four assists a game. And he's transferred back up to Indiana, and it seems like Xavier Johnson and Trace Jackson Davis, those guys are getting all the attention. Miller, Miller Cop, like – Parker Stewart can go. He could play when he was at Pitt. Now, he was on that really bad Pitt team when they were 0-18 or whatnot. But this guy is a player. If you go back and watch his film at UT Martin, he just looks different, obviously, than everybody else in their league. But at six, about 6'5", 6'6", 200 pounds physically, he's going to be able to match up against the rest of the Big Ten. And he's going to bring shooting uh, – to Indiana. Now he only shot 35% at UT Martin, but some of the shots he's taken, if you go back and look at those things, they were tough. He's going to, he's going to have to take better shots in order to stay on the floor for IU and coach Woodson. I think he's going to be nearly a 40% shooter. And I think Indiana fans are really going to enjoy watching him play for my freshman. And it's simply because he's playing in Nebraska, Bryce McGowan's top consensus, top 20 player, six, six, and guys don't look like him too often extremely long arms, extremely fluid athlete, a plus jump shooter, and he is a switchable defender. And it's about time that Hoiberg got it going in Nebraska because he's starting to finally get some talent over there. Big Ten's tough, but I think Bryce McGowan's could be in line, maybe not for a freshman of the year, but he could definitely be on that all-freshman team at the end of the season and, quite frankly, probably be a top-20 pick in the draft. I'm just throwing that out there. Wow. After this wow. season, Whoa. he is that talented. He is that talented. Oh. Look at you. All right, fans, who do you have on the most underappreciated players list? Yeah, so I'm going to go with two mid-major guys who I think uh, if if their team's able to make it to the NCAA tournament, that we could hear Bill Raftery using their names in sayings going out to break. So for me, it's here comes the Osun. Uh, and I'm going to go with Osun Osani. Just did the St. Bonaventure preview last week, and, and I feel like if Atlantic 10 fans and St. Bonaventure fans know who Osun is, Osani is, but I don't think that the nation fully appreciates just how big time this kid is and how big time this kid will be for a Bonnie's team that's ranked in the top 25. St. Bonaventure has a quality non-conference schedule, so you're going to get a chance to watch this team play. And what you will find is, is that the six foot ten big man from Pleasantville, New Jersey, is a really, really good player. Yeah, he averages around a double-double, but he's somebody who doesn't miss. He shoots almost 60% from the floor. He is physical when he's on the floor versus when he's not on the floor. It's the difference for St. Bonaventure. They need Osun, and for them to reach their full heights, they're going to need him to have a big-time year. I think he could go from 10 and 10 maybe to, you know, 14 and 12 or or something even more than that. So seniors win. He's a senior who I don't know if he's going to get the national play, but I could see him being on Scott Van Pelt in February if St. Bonaventure's having a historic season because SVP gives those guys love that others, other national people don't. We're going to give them some love here throughout the year. We're going to be following America's college basketball team, St. Bonaventure. The other, can, I, can I make one point real quick? I just want to say, look, Atlantic 10 fans, St. Bonaventure fans, VCU not fans, but it's a fan of that league. I, didn't, I did not call your league mid-major. T.O. did not call your league mid-major. That was, that was John Fanta that called your league mid-major, okay? I just – look, I'm, I'm I'm an innocent bystander. Please do not yell at me about I'm this. I'm sorry. He did not – it was not me. It was John. My ears perked up too when we, you we said all love, We all love Fanta. The blame is on him. I did not say anything about mid-major. Look, you know what? Point blank, okay? The the proof is in the pudding. Um, Atlantic 10 is as good of, of one as any. Um, but, okay, so, so all right. Well, let's stop the conversation now. The podcast has been stopped here, okay? Um, we're, we're now going to transition here. Hold on. Hold on. Let me get on my hotel phone here and call room service. Here's the fact of the matter. There's power conference. What What is the Atlantic 10 then? Uh, it's it's some something in the middle. It's something in what the, the middle. What the hell does that mean? It's something in the middle. <laughs> it's a gray area question. That's like if you order a steak and they ask you how you'd like, and you're like, eh, you know, like I I don't. Well, here's the thing. There's there's rare, and there's medium, and then there's medium rare, right? <laughs> so, so is the Atlantic 
Atlanta medium rare conference? The, the, Atlanta, the Atlanta 10 is the medium rare conference of college basketball. <laughs> Not quite rare, but yeah, but I it's mean, that's why I need a steak. Yeah. Oh, it is. So maybe, yeah, but I think that we just invented the line. That's someone put that on a t shirt. Yeah. The Atlanta 10 is the medium rare conference of college basketball. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> wow. That's uh, pretty. Uh, yeah, I have continue. one other player. <laughs> well, and the other, the other player should be a well known player uh, by people in the Mountain West. I'm not going to categorize this league, but I, I will go with the player that I think uh, could be the, the best player in the Mountain West, and certainly the coaches believe this in the preseason honors, and that is Grant Sherfield. Like, Grant Sherfield's numbers oh. at Nevada are ridiculous. Ridiculous. You're telling me that this guy averaged. I'm sorry. I did not watch a lot of Nevada basketball. I'm sorry, Sean Paul. I apologize. I will be watching CBS Sports Network after dark this year. This kid averaged 19 a game. He averaged six assists per game. He shot the basketball 43% last season. And he's only a junior. The junior, Grant Sherfield, I'm staying up to watch him. He's giving me a reason to to watch. I, I think the Mountain West is a good league this year. And I think it's a league that could get three teams into the big dance, which is, which is good for that league. Grant Sherfield, I'm on the Sherfield wagon. I took a look at this kid's numbers, some of his metrics, and my goodness, he could be playing. He could be playing a level up even, you know, Nevada is a good program. He could be playing at a big time, big 10 program or something. I think this kid is really, really special, Rob. Yeah, he's, he's really good. Um, the, the Mountain West as a whole, is, uh, has some really underrated players. One guy that I, I thought about putting on my list, um, but I, I went with someone else for this, was David Roddy at mm. Colorado State, who is like, I mean, he's he's about 6'4", he's like 260, and he kind of plays like point center for them. He's a little bit, he's like the Mountain West, he's the medium rare version of uh, of Draymond Green. Uh, he's he's fun to watch, like if, <laughs> if you guys haven't seen him. And he, he might actually be the second best player on Colorado State. They got a point guard named Isaiah Stevens that is an absolute stud. I, I think that Colorado State wins the Mountain West this year, but that's uh, that's just me. All right, my underrated players, guys we're not talking enough about. Number one on my list, the returning guy, is Adama Sanogo at UConn. I've, I've made this point before. But How could he possibly be underrated? You've brought him up on every time every we talk day, about yeah. UConn. Every, every time. We th- but look, here's here's my thing. <laughs> I, I well, think wait, is this is this to get back at the UConn fans because uh, I saw somebody put yeah, how about that yeah they I, I, come on they gave they me a attacked one-star you. review <laughs> they gave you a one star review come on man at least it, like what yeah that one, that one hurt. um anyway so Adama yeah. Sonogo like I just I think that he's going to end up having the kind of season where you say okay he's the best big guy in the Big East this season. Right, and I, I wouldn't qualify um, the Champagne kid at uh, at, at St. John's. I, I can never remember which one is which. I know one of them's in the pro, I'm pretty sure Julian is at, at St. John's, right? Did you say best big kid? Best big guy in the Big East. I think Adam, Adama Sonoga will be the best big guy in the Big East this year. I think he will average like fourteen and nine. I think he's going to be a monster on the offensive glass, and I think he's going to end up being the guy. Everyone's talking about R.J. Cole and Tyrese Martin right now for that program. I think Adama Sanogo is going to be the best player on UConn. I think we're going to know it uh, probably within the first month of the season, and I, I don't think it would be crazy to say that he's going to be the best big guy in the Big East in uh, the, this upcoming season. I, I Look, I know you're an Nate Watson guy, Fanta, but I, I think I think Adama, like it just – Ask anyone around that program, and, and, and what they'll tell you is like he just he keeps getting better, keeps getting better, keeps getting better. He's a basketball junkie. He can score over either hand. He's, he can pass a little bit. And like I said, monster on the glass. So I think he's a guy that's not getting discussed enough. Uh, mm-hmm. Remember, remember what, what did Tyrese Martin tell us on, on the Big East shoot-around, Phantom? What did he tell us? He told us that Adama Snuggle will be a first-teamer in the Big East. He right, He said write it in pen. Write it in pen. Write it in pen. Adama Snow will be first teamer in the biggies. Uh, freshman that's not getting enough conversation. Um, he's is Peyton Watson for me at UCLA. He's been kind of overshadowed by the fact like he might be the third best wing on that team with Jaime Hawkins and Johnny Juzang there. But I mean, we've talked about how UCLA needed to solve their defensive issues to be able to become a top five team. And I think Peyton Watson, what he could do on that end of the floor is going to be the guy that kind of 
solves a lot of those. Like he, he'll be able to make up him and Miles Johnson are going to be able to make up for a lot of defensive mistakes that some of uh, some of Mick Cronin's guards are going to make at some point during the season. So Peyton Watson to me is a guy that needs to get uh, more love and more hype. And it's going to be something that is continues throughout the season, because I guarantee no one's going to be talking about this dude when you have Johnny Juzang and Jaime Hawkins, two all Americans in front of him. I, I don't think it'd be crazy to say he's going to end up being a lottery pick. He might average eight points a game. And I, I love dudes like wow. that will be willing to kind of buy into that role and do what they need to do to be able to get wins. And at the end of the day, if you're an NBA team looking for a role player, you want a guy that's going to be able to do a job, accept a role and help you get wins. Right. So I'm, I'm a big, big Peyton Watson guy. And I think that he's going to uh, be impressive, even if it doesn't have great numbers. All right. The next thing that we wanted to talk about, Fanta, I think this was your uh, your topic. You wanted the coach with the toughest task heading into the season. So uh, am I right? was that Fanta who, who came yeah, up? With that, that was yeah, that was Fanta. So Fanta, why don't you lead us off the coach with the toughest task heading into the 2021-22 season? Remember here, toughest task. The toughest task is going to be able to make all these pieces and parts mesh at Memphis. Penny Hardaway has the toughest task in college basketball this season. He has the most pressure on himself in college basketball this season. Memphis is supposed to be back. They are supposed to be back. When you're back on the recruiting trail, everyone equivocates that to being back on the floor. Guess what? That's not how college basketball works, especially in 2021. Will Memphis find someone who can calm the waters in that backcourt? Someone who can manage the game? Do they have a point guard? Do they have a stabilizing presence? Jalen Duran and Imani Bates are two incredible talents. And Penny Hardaway brought in Larry Brown. I thought it was a great ad. So it's not all on him, uh, but that staff is unique. The team dynamic is unique. Uh, Landers Nolly, you know, quality player. But are they are they going to be able to get contributions consistently from guys on the offensive end of the floor? They play in a conference that is not particularly strong. Their non-conference offers some challenges. Can they be ready? Can they be ready? Because your non-conference is really important. Will they be ready for those types of tests? I don't know. Um, I want Penny Hardaway to turn around Memphis. I think it'd be a great story to get them in the second weekend. That is, That would be great for college basketball. But there's no coach with more pressure on him because if there's an off-season champion in this sport, it's the Memphis Tigers. And when you're the off-season champion – you now have a lot of pressure on yourself when you've been on the job for a couple years to get this right. So I went a different direction that then, and I went with two schools, not necessarily the coaches, but the schools. So we were talking about the toughest job. I went with Vanderbilt and I went with Wofford, both for academic reasons, but two different reasons. One, Vanderbilt can't take transfers. It's such a good academic institution. It's very difficult to take transfer. So with the initial transfer rule now in effect, where guys can get eligible immediately, it took them completely out of the equation with that. So Stackhouse has got his hands full. Second, I went with Wofford. And I went and visited with Wofford last week. And I was sitting talking to Jay McCauley. And he talked about, well, Storm Murphy, he actually wanted to stay. But we don't have grad school. Wofford College doesn't have grad school, so they can't take grad transfers. That's held them back as well. And the problem was, was he wanted to stay, but in order for him to stay, he would have had to take 22 hours of accounting in order to stay eligible. He's not staying at Wofford. We got to get Wofford College to Wofford University quick, fast, and in a hurry for them to be able to compete on the same playing field as everybody. When they let these transfer rules go into effect with kids able to go with wherever they wanted. They didn't take into account some of these academic institutions that only they do things a certain way. Wow. And Wofford not being able to get some grad transfers, I mean, that is difficult. And they can't keep their kids. So say so, uh, arbitrary situation, you keep these kids for summer school, they get ahead on classes, they graduate after their junior year, like a lot of students do. Are you going to be able to get them for their senior year? That could be a problem. They're going to have to add some kind of a master's program there at Wofford. Well, we talked about tough jobs. You, you, you probably did exactly what was needed, and I didn't think about it like that, but I heard tough jobs. So as soon as I heard that, I heard what circumstance could limit 
a coach. So yes. I thought about Vanderbilt with transfers and I thought about grad school with Wofford. One thing I would say about that that I think could end up benefiting the program if they they play it the right way is if they become the place where you can go for three years, build up your stock, and go from being a guy that is looked at as a mid-major recruit to being someone that can go from Wofford to Virginia Tech for your last season, you might mm-hmm. be able – I think you're better off getting three years of Storm Murphy, even if you don't get him for a fourth year, than you are getting four years of the kid that's the next level down from Storm. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? So well, they got, four, they got four years out of Storm. Well, I, I'm just saying for like the next, if you for using your example, um, yeah. the, the, I think if you play that right and you become the place that that sends kids up to the next level, that's not necessarily necessarily a bad thing for a program. I mean, look, every every college in the country is dealing with that. Even at the high major level, you got guys that you bring them in, you coach them for two years, they're off to the NBA if you do your job right. So, becoming well, the place that can get those people up to the next level is, is something that can be really good for mid majors if they do it the right way. I don't know if we've talked about it on this podcast, but I've talked about it before. I've talked to a head coach and a head coach in the OVC. He's like, yeah, well, our our whole ordeal is we're trying to bring kids in and say, hey, come here for two years. After two years, you play really well for us. We're going to help you go to a power conference. That's part of the recruiting pitch now. Yeah, should be. So I mean, that's kind of where we're at with this whole thing. It's the it's the smart way to do it if you're at that level, because it's the it's honestly it's the exact same pitch. Just instead of saying, we're going to get you from the OVC to the big 12. It's the guys in the big 12 are saying, we're going to get you from our program to the NBA, you know, it's two years. So it's, it's yeah. just the way it's the way basketball works these days. And if you can kind of buy into it and embrace it and lean into it, then you're doing a, you're doing a good job for me. Um, I, I mean, mine, I thought mine was kind of obvious. I, I went just straight with the toughest thing you're going to have to do. And there's only one guy in college basketball this season. Well, there's one guy that has to coach Remy Martin and try to win games with him. That's not going to be fun to do. We'll see if that ends up working out, but, uh, replacing a hall of famer is a nightmare scenario. And that is what Hubert Davis is doing this season at North Carolina. I think that he's going to end up doing a good job with this. We've talked enough about my, uh, my infatuation with Caleb Love and what I think he could end up being. Um, but I do think that you, I mean, <laughs> you never want to be the guy that replaces the guy, right? You want mm-hmm. to replace the guy that replaced the guy, if that makes sense. But Hubert Davis is replacing Roy Williams. Those are huge, huge shoes to try to fill. And I don't think you should ask him to be Roy Williams. That, that's just, if you were telling, if you're saying that if he doesn't win three national titles, he's a disappointment, like that is an unrealistic expectation to put on anybody. Uh, but I, I think he'll do a good job. But I mean, that's it's it's tough, man. It's tough when you go and take over a job that has that level of expectation, replacing a coach that was that good at what he does. Um, the right answer is Mike Boynton. Well, yeah, true. Now it now it is. Now that's it is. the right answer. Yeah, that like, is. You're right. You're that's right. the most difficult one. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's it's Mike Boynton. Now we don't need to rehash that. I was just in a good mood again, T.O. You had to yeah, go I know. Out. I ruined it. I, did, I actually kind of did that on purpose. Uh, <laughs> you right, were starting so, to cheer up a little bit. I wanted aggressive. I wanted aggressive Doster. So uh, <laughs> aggressive Doster. So we're gonna. I'm I'm doing this on the fly, but at the end of the show, we're we're all gonna make our final four picks. We have to officially log our final four predictions. <laughs> The show. Uh, so you guys are going to have a chance to think about that. Before we do, I just want to let you know that Bet Rivers has just put out lines for the Champions Classic games. So while you think about who your official, officially official Final Four picks are going to be, let's talk a little bit about these games. Kansas at BetRivers.com is laying five against Michigan State. That total is 145.5. If you like the dog, Michigan State's money line is plus 180. That means that if you bet $100, you will win uh, you will profit $180. You'll win $280. That's how those money lines work. Uh, Duke is favored by a point and a half against Kentucky. The total for that game is 149.5, and Duke's money line is plus 104. Let's start with the first game. Kansas, Michigan State, five-point line. T.O., I'm going to you first. I'm teeing you up. I'm throwing up that lob. What do you got? Give me Kansas. I just feel like their skill level is so much higher than Michigan State's is so far this year, at least from what I've seen from last season. Uh, Max Christie has to be really, really good. And golly, what a way to welcome him to college basketball than to play Kansas first game. I think that's going to be difficult. So go ahead and give me Kansas. I think that they will actually think they'll cover because I think it's going to be a huge adjustment for Tyson Walker as well. And then the freshman, Max Christie's jumping right in, unless he's kind of a Zion-type freshman, which he hasn't been billed as such. 
Uh, I think it's going to be a little bit of an adjustment period. And I think Michigan State's going to be better this year. But I, I, I do have a lot of respect for Bill Self in Kansas. I think he's actually going to get Remy to play the right way eventually. But I think Kansas has enough that they'll be able to cover. Fanta? I think Michigan State's going to cover this spread. I'm gonna go <laughs> Let's go. I'm going to go with the Spartans. I, I just have a gut feeling about this game. I think that uh, my biggest question with M- Michigan State is, in addition to Walker, T.O., absolutely. Like, does mm-hmm. he translate? Is he? A, it's a sizable chunk to go mm-hmm. from Northeastern to the Big Ten. But will Malik Hall be the breakout guy for the Spartans? If yep. Malik Hall is that breakout player for Michigan State, that that's the type of player that can really be a, a leading force for a Tom Izzo led team. He's six foot seven. He's a combo forward. He does a lot of little things well, and he showed some real flashes last season. What does Malik Hall bring to to the table now this season? And then will the real Joey Hauser show up? Joey Hauser last year was a disappointment for this Michigan State team. Um, they they need him to have a bounce back campaign. Uh, I think that Walker's an upgrade from, from Rocket Watts. Uh, I don't know how big of an upgrade it will be. I think Michigan State comes into this game being totally counted out, not having a number next to their name. I think Kansas may still be figuring out. Kansas is the more talented team, but you guys all know this. In November, sometimes the more talented team just doesn't win for whatever reason. Uh, I think Tom Izzo's got it pegged up on a bulletin board that that – his Spartans team is is kind of being counted out uh, in a loaded Big Ten. I kind of like that dynamic, and I think that this Spartans team isn't as bad as maybe they showed at times last year. I like Michigan State to cover, to cover. I don't know if they win the game, but I think they're going to hang around and could see them doing something late in this game to cover the spread. Give me the Spartans. So I, I tend to lean towards Michigan State in this spot as well for a couple reasons. One, Jalen Wilson got the DUI. He's not going to be playing. Oh yeah, I, I, I didn't. I didn't take that into account. Yeah, Uh-oh. yeah, I didn't. Uh-oh. I Uh-oh. forgot all about that. There's just so much drama. There's so much drama going on right now in college hoops. Like I just get lost in the shuffle. Some drama. <laughs> some some drama. There's some drama. Drama. What is that? Drama. drama. I'm just kidding. Drama. Is that, is that a southern thing? No, well, it's that just, one like it's, a split hole. It's a, it's a, it's a <laughs> bullshit thing. <laughs> um, yeah. All right, so I, I I tend to lean towards Michigan State. Jalen Wilson not going to be there. I'm a little bit worried about Remy Martin as well. Um, two things stand out to me. One, uh, he did not start their exhibition last night. He had 16 points and four assists, but he did not start the exhibition. Um, and my understanding is that's the kind of thing where Bill Self is trying to send this dude a message, mm-hmm. saying like, look. You, you need to be on the same page with me. And another thing stood out. We had Jesse Newell on the Kansas preview episode uh, yesterday. And what he said is that Remy Martin at, at Big 12 Media Day, when they asked what was the most difficult thing that you have to get used to, he said, I don't run back to the ball. Meaning when you kind of get into a play and you get into an action, you're supposed to go to a place, space the floor, and, and, and stay in that set. He has Ooh. a habit, what happened at Arizona State, Every time he gave up the ball, he'd run back and go get it, and in the last 10 seconds would be in isolation for him. So he hasn't figured out like exactly how to operate as a point guard within a system where he's not going to be the guy asked to take 20 shots a game. And that, to me, is a red flag. So uh, those two things make me tend to think that Michigan State will be ready uh, off the jump a little bit more. I also think it's worth noting Michigan State had a bunch of COVID issues last season. Um, every time it felt like they started getting things going in the right direction, they were shut down for a couple of weeks. So um, – I like Michigan State in that spot. It's never a bad idea to bet on Tom Izzo. All right, Duke laying a point and a half against Kentucky. That total is 149. Fanta, I'm going to you on this one first. I am taking Kentucky in this game. I think they're the best value of the entire night. Um, I love the Wildcats. I think there's a dynamic to playing Duke this season, knowing it's Coach K's last round and being able to say that you that you won that game. I also think there's a dynamic that Kentucky just had their worst year in a very, very, very long time. And I think that that has served as an off-season point. While there's different players, it's still the same coach, and it's still the same big blue. And I think that Kentucky comes out in this game. I think Oscar Shibway is going to unveil to America 
the kind of leap that he has taken in the offseason. And I believe that Kellen Grady is a, is a guy who could be, could end up being the top player in the Southeastern Conference when it's all said and done, because I think he's the perfect fit for Coach Cal's style. The key for me is just how good is Severe Wheeler. Um, and, and will he come into this program and be efficient? Will he make the right plays? We're going to know right away. Like, Kentucky's backcourt last year, no semblance of any rhythm. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think now with Wheeler in the fold, with some of those returnees, it's Paolo Bancaro's collegiate debut, but there's more than Paolo Bancaro on the floor. And I, I, have, I still have some more questions that I need to know the answers to with Duke uh, at this stage of the game. I think there's going to be a lot of pressure around this game. I think Coach K is going to be the center of media attention all day on Tuesday. When Get Up comes on the air, they're going to be pumping it out. Like, they're going to come on the air. They're going to say, we are at the Garden tonight. College basketball's back. Let's focus on a half hour with Coach K. Don't tell me that stuff doesn't matter. It does. All that stuff, it's going to be a lot, and particularly on Tuesday when it's your first game of the year. And, oh, by the way, you have to play the Kentucky Wildcats. I'm going with UK in this game. I think they're in a better place today. I do. I watched both exhibitions, but Duke's exhibition with uh, Winston-Salem State, it was ridiculous. I think they were up 50 at half. Like, it was a joke. Yeah, I, I watched they, that. There was one point the score was 63 to 10. <laughs> yeah, it was like it, – it was absurd. But there was a couple of things that happened. One, they shot the ball well. Of course, Winston-Salem State it's not, doesn't have that kind of length. But watching Kentucky's exhibition was a little bit different. Their length and athleticism and Ty Ty Washington and Damian Collins – They are eye popping. And the other freshman that they stole from Louisville, that reminds me a lot of, was it PJ Washington? Um, Gosh, what's the kid's name? Bryce. Uh, Yep. Yeah, I just blanked on it big time. Bryce Hopkins? Bryce Bryce Hopkins. Hopkins. Bryce Hopkins. He was impressive. And with all those veterans on that team, I want to, I keep making myself want to say Kentucky. I want to say Kentucky. But I think Mark Williams and Paolo Bancaro are going to be too good. So just oh. for just for the be the devil's advocate, give me Duke. Give me Duke. I think they can pull it off because I think Oscar Tshibwe is the big thing that Kentucky didn't have last year. But I think that Mark Williams with his length can negate that a little bit. So give me Duke. Yeah, so I'm I tend to lean towards Fanta's side here, but that's just because of what the line is. Right. I, don't, I think that these two teams are even. I don't think that there should be different uh, a point difference. Um, it should be a pick them. Yeah, I think it should be a pick them. So I think if you're might getting, be by Tuesday morning, it might be. Yeah. So I, I think if you're getting Kentucky at plus value, you got to you got to take Kentucky as the underdog in the spot. Um, but I mean, we're going to get into this with our final four picks. I, I think that these are two of the five best teams in college basketball. And we'll be saying that uh, as the season kind of moves along. You mentioned Ty Ty, T.O. That mm-hmm. dude I, I think, is excellent. Yeah, I think he's going to end up being a monster. To me, I, I think he's going to take over that starting point guard spot. He's just he's so good on the ball, and the way that he can kind of get to his spots and make shots. I'm I'm very excited to see what he can kind of develop into this year. He's got shooting all over the floor yep. around him this year. He's got big guys that can go with lineups where you play Damian and, and Big Sheep together. You can put Keon Brooks at the four, and all of a sudden you have a very modern lineup. You roll like. CJ Frederick and and uh, and Kellen Grady out there with them, so I'm I'm very bullish on what this Kentucky team could end up being. Same same thing with Duke. I watched a bunch of film of Paolo Bancaro this week. Yeah, like some just, of his some I'm of the stuff he did in that line. exhibition. Just just wait till you see what this dude is capable of doing. Like he 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 is special. As much hype as guys like Chet Holmgren and Jaden Hardy are getting, to me like. By December, I, I I think my hottest take for the draft cycle is going to be that Paolo Bancaro is the clear-cut, obvious, definitive number one pick uh, in this year's draft. Come like mid-December, he's 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 special. He's special. All right, so let's get to our final four picks, guys. Uh, who wants to go first? Fanta, you that's want a to hell, first? that's a hell of a thing just to kind of throw it on you. Yeah, sure. Here we go. Definitive. We're going to put it out. We're going to put it on on uh, on Twitter. It's your, it's your it's your definitive statement. We are tying your ability to say that you are a basketball analyst into w- picking these final four teams. So, T.O., it's a ton of pressure, man. A lot know, of pressure. A lot of – I know you played some high-level basketball in your life. I did. Nothing, nothing has ever been more pressure-packed than this moment right here. 
So All right, give me give me Gonzaga right off the bat. Okay. Um, I want to pick Texas. There's just so many moving pieces. Uh, so give me Gonzaga, Texas. I, there's going to be a team from the SEC there. I disagree with that. I th- there, there's got to be. You, you think it might? They might Big Ten it, huh? Yeah, I just don't think that there's a national champion in that conference this year. Man, this is hard. UCLA, give me go ahead and give me UCLA because they have just they, they have so much. Pay Watts and Miles Johnson, those two additions are going to be huge. So I got Gonzaga, Texas, UCLA, and uh, you got to do it. You got to do it. You're committed now. You have to pick an SEC team. It just means more. Who are you going with? Give me Arkansas. Oh, oh give me Arkansas. <laughs> uh, the must bus is fired up and ready to must go. Bus. The must bus. No, I not no. In all seriousness, Arkansas. I didn't do. I, I can't. I can't. This is against the rules. Give me Purdue. Okay, you can do. Oh, give me oh, oh. <laughs> can I get five for four? Can I get five for four? <laughs> T- sure. T- oh, T- okay. I was like, I, he's just gonna name the entire top twenty-five. <laughs> <laughs> Four of these oh, teams get it's funny ball. too because I kind of want to throw Auburn in there. Take Auburn. You got. Hey, look, we're gonna go to Fanta. To you make a decision, and we'll come back. Yeah, yeah throw, uh, come back to me. So, come back. Go to Fanta. To you make a decision, come back. <laughs> Michigan. Uh, I'm gonna go with Michigan. Getting back to the Final Four. Jawan Howard, uh, I think, has done an incredible job. They do have a lot of new pieces. They have some moving pieces and parts here. Um, but I like that that transfer that they brought in from Coastal Carolina, um, and I, I think that Hunter Dickinson is going to only be even better. Uh, and my goodness, that's saying something. Eli Brooks should be in a good place. I like the Wolverines. I've got Gonzaga. I'm joining UTO until uh, they show me otherwise. They're a Final Four team, and uh, I'm I'm curious to see just how all that pans out. I know I was a little critical of the Timmy Holmgren thing last week. I still think they're a damn great basketball team. I think they just have some things to kind of figure around to be a national championship team. Um, I don't think this team, this year's team is as good as last year's team. I think last year's team also ran into an absolute buzzsaw at the time in Baylor. I've got Gonzaga going back to the final four. Then I've got Texas. I go against you on that because I think while there's so many moving pieces and parts, there is one constant. And that one constant is Chris Beard. When Chris Beard is on the sidelines, you're going to win a lot of basketball games. That team is too talented to not make the Elite Eight. I mean it. I look at Texas. I see a team that absolutely should play for a regional final. Um, They're just so, so loaded from top to bottom. And then, and maybe it's because we just got off the preview with Dana O'Neill. I'm taking Villanova to be that fourth Final Four team. I think Justin Moore could be Josh Hart-esque here this season for the Villanova Wildcats. Justin Moore is going to be a superstar. Jermaine Samuels, another year of this guy. He's a pro, maybe not a maybe not a guy that you think of like NBA draft, but he's a pro in the way that he plays the game, the way that he plays the game. He does every little thing right. He covers up so much space for Villanova. And at point guard, Mr. Gillespie manages the game. Villanova was in the Sweet 16 without Colin Gillespie. I don't care who they played. They were in the second weekend. I think they go a little further this year. I think they find a way to make the Final Four. All right, so I, I don't I don't actually hate um, some of the, the picks that you guys have made. I think Texas is a good one. Uh, I have Gonzaga as one of the teams um, in my Final Four. I think that one's pretty obvious. We talk about all the big guys, but I just want to mention Andrew Nemhard is back. They added Razier Bolton, and Nolan Hickman, I think, is going to come in and be a guy that surprises a lot of people. There are really good players in their backcourt, and they have two All-Americans in their frontcourt. That's a very good basketball team. Hunter Salas, too. Yep. I, yeah, he, I mean, he's going to be really good, too. Uh, number two on my list of Final Four teams is UCLA. I've been high on them all season long. I could put together a pretty coherent argument saying that they are the best team in college basketball this year. I think their wing trio is as good as anybody. I think Miles Johnson is a difference maker. And Tiger Campbell, we've talked about this before on the show, uh, just I think he's ready to um, step into kind of that like big time uh, leadership point guard. Uh, To me, like he's never going to put up big numbers, but if you look at like what you want out of a winning point guard, all of the stuff uh, that you can't, What's the word that I'm looking for? All, all of the cliche stuff that point guards do, I think we're going to see that out of Tiger Campbell this season. I'm going to stick with the blue blood theme here. 
And I teased it a little bit talking about the Champions Classic preview. I'm going to have Duke and I'm going to have Kentucky in my final four. Oh, my oh, wow. goodness gracious. I, I just think I think Paolo Bancaro is too good to overlook. Combine him with Mark Williams having a sophomore season. Combine him with what I think Jeremy Roach is going to end up being. Combine him with the fact that A.J. Griffin and Wendell Moore are going to be able to be those defensive presences on the wing. Combine it with the fact that I think Joey Baker is going to take a step forward this season. I mean, you ask anyone on that staff, and they're going to tell you that Joey Baker had one of the best summers of anybody in that program. So I I think Duke's going to be the team to make a run this year. I know it's it's very cliche to say, oh, yeah, this is Duke's year. But I, I do think that this is the season where Duke uh, finds a way to put it all together in Coach K's last year. And then Kentucky, man. Like, I just – I love the way that they're built. I love the shooting. I love the versatility of their front line. And I do think Ty Ty Washington – like, this is all kind of dependent on Ty Ty Washington, like, taking over that lead guard role. But I do think he's going to take over that lead guard role, be an wow. all-American caliber point guard, be a guy that we're talking about as a potential top 10 pick. Um, and if you if he is that guy – at the point guard spot with the shooting that they have, with the depth that they have, with the lineup versatility they have, I think Kentucky's there's, there's quite a bit of value. So uh, we talked about this on the futures uh, future bets podcast that we did on Monday, but I do like Duke and Kentucky for their overall uh, betting national title futures. It's 13 to one and 14 to one for those two programs respectively. Tio, have you made a decision yet? Have you yeah, I made a decision. I made a decision. So I'm going Gonzaga, UCLA. Uh Oh, <laughs> let's go <laughs> this is this is high this is high level this is awesome this <laughs> is all right keep it going keep it going keep it going that's going. So, gonna ever happen on this show that is not, 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 not you go, you go, if you made your mind up and you go, I am, I am, we go to color bars. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, CEO, keep it going. Let's go uh, Gonzaga, UCLA, uh, for all the same reasons you just said. Give me Purdue. I think everybody's harping on their shooting. I think they have a lot. I think they have enough. They don't have to have a ton. They have enough. And I have so much faith in Coach Painter. Zach Ivey's obviously been great. Travion Williams is down there, too. Brandon Newman is a good player. Sasha Stefanovic is a good shooter. Like they've got guys around it and they really know how to play. And I think Purdue's just going to be able to guard. So give me Purdue. And I kind of flipped. I love the must bus, but I'm not going to must bus. I'm going to go Auburn. I think Walker Kessler, Jabari Smith, super talented, super athletic bigs that are going to be able to, they might not win the SEC. That's the crazy part, but they might still make it to the final four. Uh, just because I think matchups obviously play a huge role. And I have a lot of faith in Bruce Pearl when it comes to his on the court coaching. I think he's excellent. Then they have a guy named Alan Flanagan, who is a bucket, who is really, really good. So he could be your go-to scorer. And they struggled with point guard play last year, but they added three transfers in the off season. Surely to God, one of them will be serviceable. So I like Auburn to make it to the final four. There's your hot take, Fanta. I like it. That's hot. That's hot. That's hot. I like it. Right. Listen, this has been fun, gentlemen. We've been here for more than an hour. Uh, that's why you saw that my camera died on this uh, on the show, so much for forty minutes, which is actually good because I wanted to get a test in to see how long that that battery can last. And we found out about uh, it looks like about ninety eight minutes is how long that battery can last while we're filming. So, which is perfect when we do this live show uh, coming up on Wednesday. Oh, I shouldn't have teased that, should I? Anyway, oh, or hey. Terrence Oglesby. For John Fanta, this has been... See you guys Monday! Monday! See you Monday.